Welcome to the Talent Learning Show podcast series, episode 80 with independent learning tech analyst John Lay. Today, I interview Richard Adair, CEO of the Learning Network, about the business impact of extended and virtual reality in education. You can find more of our fiercely independent content at talenttolearning.com. Well, welcome back, everyone. It's great to have you here again. On this show, I am fortunate to interview experts in learning technology from both the vendor and the practitioner sides of the fence. Today is no different. Our guest, Richard Adair, is a vendor expert in the field of XR, VR, AR, MR, and its application in the business world. This is a topic we haven't gotten to in our first 79 episodes of the show. Why? I got no idea. I think I and many people think that XR and VR is cool, but maybe too expensive and futuristic for practical use. Turns out, I was wrong. When I met Richard not too long ago and learned what his company is doing with XR, I knew I had to have him on the show to teach us all. XR is here now. It has tons of cool business applications, but more importantly, it's measurable, and there's a heck of a lot of a return on investment. What's the difference between XR, AR, VR, and MR? What industries are leading the charge? What are the business application? What's it cost? What are real-life examples? Let's find out. Richard, welcome to the Talent Learning Show. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So we got through 80 episodes, Richard, and we've never talked about XR, AR, VR, MR. We're going to talk about all that today and bring uh, listeners up to speed here on what's really the high end, what's the best of content development that's out there uh, in the learning world today. What's that look like? Why are people using it? What's the business reasons driving it? Those are the things we're going to talk about today with our guest expert, uh, Richard here from the Learning Network. Uh, but maybe we should start there. Richard, why don't you take a step back, tell us about your organization, who it is, what you guys do, and we'll start there, and then we'll start digging into the, the XR stuff. Sure. Thanks, John. So the Learning Network uh, has been around 28 years. Uh, we have offices in Canada, U.S., and the U.K. Uh, we've done over 2,000 courses for clients in all industries. Uh, we have three learning management systems that can cover sort of the cheaper, easy to spin up at the low end to a, a mid-level for people that are more sophisticated to an enterprise end for major Fortune 500 companies. So we we cover the gamut of uh, helping uh, people with their learning programs. And really what we like to say is we're learning driven by data backed by science. So, you know, if you look at the technology evolution over the years, way back from Flash uh, through Storyline to XR now, we're always uh, applying learning science to the technologies they develop and are now applying that to XR, which is very exciting. And that's different than, say, other XR companies that might come from a gaming background where they're really great at creating virtual environments, but don't have a learning that's to maximize the, the effectiveness of the learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. 28 years, three learning management systems. Uh, that, that's quite the uh, that's quite the lineup. Uh, but a lot of us, including myself, when I met you, oh, geez, I don't know, less than six months ago, don't know what the difference is between XR, AR, VR, MR, all these R's. What's it mean, Richard? Help us out. So extended reality is an umbrella term that includes VR, which is virtual reality, AR, augmented reality, and MR, mixed reality. So if you think of it, virtual reality is when you're immersed in the headset, immersed in a virtual world. Think of some of the games you might play on Meta where you have no interaction with the physical environment and you're taken somewhere else. Augmented reality uh, basically overlays digital content onto the real world. Uh, for example, we've done some posters, a hunting poster, believe it or not, where the, the animals come jumping out in sort of a 3D way when somebody looks at it. So that would be augmented, the, the reality that they're seeing. And then mixed reality is a bit more sophisticated. We're integrating virtual objects into the real world and then enabling the users to interact with them. So example of that, one of our projects in automotive, we have technicians training on how to service electric vehicles. They're building a circuit board. They're actually moving virtual ob objects from a tool tray into the circuit board. So uh, all different types and flavors, different budgets, but uh, you know you can basically pick the best one to give an ROI for the client's needs. Mm -hmm. And so what are the major trends in uh, XR, extended reality, the umbrella term uh, in, in the corporate world today? Is it is it popular? Is it only for the 1%? Like what, what's going on in, in that world? Well, it's interesting because when we talk to learning and development groups, they all say we need to understand how to use XR, but we're not sure what the application is for us. So everybody knows it's coming. 
They're trying to figure out how it fits their business, their industry. Uh, we're seeing the hardware costs come down significantly, which makes it more accessible. And we're seeing a broader adoption across industries. So, uh, you know, it really helps with things like Meta and now Apple coming out with headsets, getting the consumers and the public more used to the reality. And then that filters back into the businesses. So um, we're also seeing enhanced user experiences as the technology evolves. Mm -hmm. And what, is, you know, just from a cost standpoint, what what do you need to invest in a, in a headset nowadays? Is that like 5000 500 no, uh, virtual reality headsets are quite affordable now, about six hundred dollars. Uh, mixed reality at the higher end is, uh, you know, a couple thousand dollars, but it's come down significantly from the five thousand you reference, which which is sort of where it was at four or five years ago when we started looking at this. Yeah, well, twenty percent or less of what it used to be, so uh, it's one step closer to ubiquitous. So, what business challenges would would drive you to use that? So, you know, if you think about it, you have like a toolkit of all these tools that you have from, you know, HTML to, you know, XR. What would drive you as an organization to invest in, in the high end? What what are the business challenges that manifest that now in, in 2024? I'm sure it'll be more broad going forward. But in 2024, what are the challenges that would drive this? I'd say uh, what we say to potential clients is, what kind of training can't you do with traditional training? So for example, if you wanna train somebody in the uh, operating center of a nuclear power plant or to go into a reactor to actually repair it, you can't just throw people in there in the radiation. So you can virtually simulate that environment, create training without putting people at risk. I think most of the applications though we're seeing are really about operational efficiency and cost savings. So for example, uh, my favorite example are heavy equipment inspection system. If you think of those large trucks that haul around uh, the ore that come out of mines that are five stories high, they need to be inspected and drivers need to be trained on how to train them. But if you actually take it out of production and it's not moving ore around, the lost revenue is about $468,000 per shift. So to put that uh, machine out of production to do training and inspections, is very expensive, so we can virtually do it in virtual reality and enable that inspection to happen, make sure it's safe, make sure that we're performing plan maintenance and save that the cost of taking it out of production. Wow, wow. So it's really the same ROI calculations you use for any training, but because right. of the risk in nature of what's driving it, uh, the numbers are a whole lot bigger. So you mentioned nuclear plants or energy in general, mining. What other industries uh, would, would have this, I guess, Aviation, uh, military? Uh, aviation and military have always done simulations with those very expensive flight simulators, for example. So this is much more affordable. Uh, but we're seeing oil and gas applications, healthcare, manufacturing, as you said, mining, automotive, energy. So really where we see the, the benefit on the ROI and the value prop is if you're involving heavy equipment or production lines, that cost a lot to take out of production. It's about lost revenue or unplanned downtime or scrap. Uh, we're able to really show and demonstrate an ROI that's you know generally less than a year and sometimes a month, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and and really like in terms of the affordability of of the course part of it, and and I'll talk to the data later on in this discussion. It's not as expensive as you think. So you know, we can do a, a virtual reality course in the range of. Seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars. You can do AR and mixed reality in sort of the thirty to fifty thousand dollar range. So we're not talking millions of dollars to do a specific mm -hmm. application. And I think a lot of people think that between the hardware and and uh, the course uh, creation, this is hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. It's actually not that far off the existing sort of pricing structure for e-learning. And so as long as you can show the ROI and the savings and the specific uses where they can't do the training otherwise, it becomes really quite compelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see that. And that's really not that, I don't know what people are uh, averaging here on this call, but I think it's really easy to you know spend 20000 or even $30,000 on an hour of content still uh, just doing regular content. So it, you know it's only a factor of 2x or 3x for something that uh, is going to provide 2x or 3x or more in terms of return. And I guess that's the, the easy equation is the return right. versus the investment. So what about the, the capabilities uh, from a team standpoint? Uh, do organizations even have the ability to do this or do you always have to outsource? What, what's, what's the reality? Well, 
we're, we're going to Fortune 500 companies and they need help with XR. As I said, they know there's two parts to it. One is what application has an ROI that makes sense for me in my company, my division, you know, my space, my industry. Uh, and secondly, their, their learning development teams have really been built up with people that you know, rise in storyline and build e-learning courses. The skill set for building XR are really more like people who develop games, virtual reality games. So it's really much more technical and much more uh, software development focused, if you think of it that way, versus e-learning course development. So they generally don't have the skill set in-house. Obviously, some companies invest in it. But what we're finding is when we talk to a learning development group, they may say, we don't need any help on traditionally learning courses, which we also do. But we're really interested in doing a needs analysis on XR to figure out where that would fit. And we don't have the capability in house to build that. So generally, uh, now that can change over time as it becomes more ubiquitous, as you said, but right now they need a partner to help them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, what's a needed analysis look like, Richard, for that? So we'll basically go into the business, understand the different business units they have or divisions. Uh, again, if they're in the industries you mentioned, like manufacturing, automotive, oil and gas, et cetera, what are your pain points? Where can't you train? Where does it cost a lot of money to do training? And then we'll try and pick sort of the low hanging fruit where if you're going to get into this technology, uh, we'll pick one application prove it out and involve the business unit. The key is when we're doing these projects, because it's ROI driven, it's not just dealing with learning and development or HR, you're dealing with the business unit owners who are trying to maximize revenue, throughput, profitability. And so it's the, the combination of, uh, of, of those business unit leaders with the learning and development group, which is a little different than e-learning where generally you go to learning and development and we'll do a course on compliance and just push it out, right? So this is much more of a collaboration, which is why you have to look at the different business units and see where the pain points are at the business level. Mm, interesting, interesting. All right, so I love LMSs. And LMSs track course completions, launches, training progress in general. We're all pretty good at that. You know, that's what they've been doing for 30 years. And when I think about XR and AR, I think that's not sufficient. Um, you know, to, to track that type of stuff, you, there has to be more data. So I guess my question is two part, what kind of data do we get from virtual reality or augmented or mixed or X reality uh, in general? And where does that data go and can you do anything with it? Yeah, great question. So what's interesting about extended reality is uh, the depth and breadth of data we get is very different than what you would collect in a normal course, as you mentioned, course completion, pass fail, et cetera, we're able to now track distance, time, motion. So you can actually look at ergonomics and look at efficiencies and changes in process to improve efficiencies. So, you know, this is a new world really. And so we've actually adapted one of our LMSs, uh, Performance XR, to do analytics on that data for the clients so that you can actually track all that information. And then uh, the plan with one of our clients is to develop machine learning and predictive modeling so that you could actually do adaptive learning and make suggestions to people real time, sort of on the job training. That an example would be uh, for the electrician working on the electric vehicle, uh, if the best practice is to turn the screw in five times on that part and they only do three times, we could say, hey, you only did three times, you're going to create a defect, you need to do five. So that's sort of where this ends up. And it's really on the job training, and that's very powerful, but it's because we have this data. We can collect it. And then the end result, we can send it into an LRS or LMS. We can uh, you know, send in XP, XAPI, SCORM, uh, any format you need. And that was a lot of the work we did. It's how do you get it out of the headset through analytics and then into an LMS so they actually have the end results as well. Wow. Wow. So if you have uh, distance, time, and motion cracking in that. So the, the screw was a good example. Can you give us another one? What, what would be... Like, how would we use that data? I'm still not clear. What would be what would be a, a good use of, of that data to? Yeah. So, uh, for example, if you're doing an inspection on one of the, the large trucks mm -hmm. and somebody didn't spend enough time looking at the axle behind the tire where, you know, that's where a lot of the uh, uh -huh. maintenance occurs, they just glossed over it. You could say, hey, you didn't really inspect that and put enough focus and attention on that. You should reach out that because 
that's a high area of risk. So really we can kind of um, look over the shoulder of some of these operators and people doing inspections, for example, and and uh, advise and guide them to make sure that they don't make mistakes. Uh, interesting, interesting. And regular LMSs, they have concept of assignments that, you know, you can watch somebody, you know, perform a task. And that's kind of what this is, except that because of that risk factor, that you have an AI watch it versus uh, somebody else watch it and, and grade that task and, and offer offer feedback and advice. And so it's kind of like taking the existing technology that we have and basically putting it on steroids, really, of, of being able to, yeah. to automate that and, and do that a little better. So it's just like the next step, the next step exactly. forward. So I would imagine that uh, any organization that has the money to invest in this and the need to want to invest, mandate to invest in this, probably already has a learning management system. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, can the, do you just like pair up with them and sit on top of them, you know, from this analytic standpoint? How does that work? Uh, yes. Yeah. So we offer the Performance XR Analytics package to existing LMSs. We can integrate to them so that we can send the resultant data, as I mentioned. So we're not forcing people to buy a new LMS or rip and replace an existing one. This would be a package that overlays on top of it and gives them the benefit of XR. And again, the experience is usually fairly limited with XR within the organization. So we can kind of get them up to speed on XR and get them utilizing it properly without having to do a big system change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you mentioned earlier on, thank you. Uh, you mentioned earlier on uh, about healthcare. Tell us uh, how this would, uh, tell us some examples or, or how you would use this technology in healthcare. What, what would be some some ways to get the, the thoughts flowing here. So uh, a fairly prevalent application now is training surgeons to do surgeries. Uh, instead of cadavers, you can do it in a virtual reality environment. Uh, one of our applications, we're training nurses on respiratory testing, so stethoscopes, uh, so that they can uh, figure out how to use it properly and measure everything. And the benefit is really uh, when they actually go on the job, instead of uh, taking an inordinate amount of time from experienced nurses, from taking them away from providing care, you're hitting the floor and you're much more up to speed. So it creates efficiency in an environment where healthcare is strapped for our people. And so we allow people to get up to speed faster and make sure that all the staff are able to focus on providing healthcare and not training. How about uh, firefighting? You got some experience in there? Tell us a story. Yeah, we, we've got uh, a product of ours where we can virtually and remotely uh, get people to do their fire extinguisher training. So generally, uh, FireWise is the name of the product. People will fly people out to a facility, to a warehouse. They each have to um, expend two fire extinguishers. They have to do this every year to maintain safety uh, certifications. And so we can do this remotely. They can train on the fire extinguisher. You're not consuming fire extinguishers, you're not flying people out, you're not taking people out of their jobs, and uh, you know can save $10,000 per session just by doing that. Uh, so that's a great example of uh, you know ensuring safety compliance, but doing it in a much more efficient way through remote assistance and collaboration, as opposed to people not having to be in person. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. How about manufacturing? So that's one I see a lot with, uh, in fact, I'm in a project right now where uh, you know, it's a complex manufacturing line that costs millions and millions of dollars to, to set up. I would imagine there's tons of application uh, down that vein. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah. So there's there's a couple applications we're actually working on uh, that align with that very well. So generally uh, in the automotive industry, for example, when somebody's setting up a line, they create what's called a cardboard city. So they actually, with wood and cardboard, will create the line set it up, figure out the ergonomics, the stations, have people walk through it, make sure they're maximizing the use of space because the cost per square foot is very high. And uh, it takes a lot of labor and time and materials. So we're actually developing a virtual cardboard city where we can virtually create that line, which also allows some of the vendors that have different equipment, robots and things like that, conveyors, to remotely collaborate and move things around as opposed to being at the plant again. Uh, but where that leads, once you've done the mock-up of the line, then you can actually do virtual training for the operators. So we want them to be trained up before they ever get on the line 
so that they know their process, they know the steps. We wanna make sure that they're not creating scrap. We wanna make sure that they're not creating downtime and all that cost money similar uh, to the more than $68,000 shift in the, in the heist application I mentioned. It's similar if you're putting down an auto plant and actually higher. So really you lead to this you know, training in advance. And again, it's because it's millions of dollars of equipment it's a plant, there's millions of dollars of revenue lost if the line goes down or we have high scrap. We can train these people in advance so they hit the ground running and, and have all those benefits. Yeah, yeah. So that, that boy, that is a great use case. And not only that, if you have to bring the, the real line down for training, I mean, that has huge costs. Uh, exactly. So don't build your cardboard city. It's Just like no they get option. off the mine, you know, it's the same thing. You, you don't want to turn down production. That's why these applications of equipment and and lines where the, it's it's revenue generating, they don't want to take that down because it costs real dollars. And so that's where the ROI comes from. All right, flash forward uh, six years, you're on episode 248 of the Talented Learning Show. What's XR and VR gonna look like in 2030? What's, what's where, where is this all going? Well, I think that the technology be more integrated into everyday applications. Uh, there's going to be advances in realism, accessibility. There'll be widespread adoption across many industries. Uh, and the hardware should advance, that it should be lighter weight and simpler and more comfortable so no, more people can use it. And as I said, in automotive, uh, our goal is to have the worker on the line actually have the headset and get on-the-job training and advising them through adaptive learning so that they're more efficient, reducing scrap, meeting their throughput targets. So uh, it's, gonna, it's just going to get better and cheaper and, and more widely used. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense uh, for sure. So if you were, uh, if you are a listener right now and you're thinking, oh, I'm in manufacturing, I'm in high risk in, uh, industry, I'm in energy, I'm in aviation, transportation, maybe this is for me. What would be your advice, Richard, to help somebody that's right at that first step thinking, maybe this is for me? What advice would you give them to help sort this out and take the first steps? Well, I think you should do research into applications in your industry. That's something you can do before approaching a partner. But as I said, if you were to approach us, you can see on our website lots of videos of these applications. So you can get a flavor for the art of the possible. Uh, but what we would do is meet with you and then talk about doing a needs assessment. Uh, again, looking at different divisions you have, different applications, where are the pain points, where can't you do training, and work with you to come up with where the low-hanging fruit are and the, the highest ROI is, and to get your feet wet as opposed to some massive program. And, and even the Cardboard City, before we get into training users, we're just doing the Cardboard City, so they have to build it in wood and cardboard. The next step is then train operators in advance. So you can always kind of ease your way in from a budget point of view, from a technology adoption point of view, but you need a partner like us or other organizations to actually advise you based on our experience of the art of the possible within your business. And, and, and people know they need to use it. They just don't know how. Yeah. For technology like this, I think you really need a guide because um, um, it's not obvious uh, what the path is if you're just doing it on your own. So to yes. really leverage uh, what others have done. You know, one question, I, that's good advice. Uh, thank you. One last question uh, that I wanted to ask and I didn't. What about AI? Does AI play into this at all? Uh, in, in Yeah. Anywhere? Yeah, I mentioned that when you have, like the key with AI and machine learning is you have to have deep and broad data and it has to be rich. So with all this new data on motion and time and distance, it creates the opportunity to use AI and machine learning to create these benefits, uh, things like on the job training and suggestions while people are actually training. So really, this is a, a new world because the, the headsets are collecting data we could never collect before. And once you have that rich data, that's where AI and machine learning and predictive modeling can step in. Wow. Awesome. Who would have thought training would be so cool? You know, everybody thinks yeah, exactly. 30, 30 years ago, training is just like the most boring job you can have in corporate. And now it's like the most exciting, you know, doing the, uh, the coolest stuff and to hear what you guys are doing uh, at the learning network and, and really pushing the edge on that content and, and, uh, and unlocking huge amounts of ROI uh, in the process is, is really cool. And, and it's, it's neat to see how it, everything is evolving. And mm -hmm. that question about 2030 is, is really going to be cool to see this technology come together everywhere and in a AI way with all the data, like what could be, you know, what would be the next steps? And my guess is super, super adaptive learning, you know, for everybody 
at that point. And uh, the more adaptive, the better, I think. That's where it's been going for years. And so all very exciting stuff. Richard, thanks so much for swinging by and uh, being a guest here today on the Talented Learning Show. We, I learned a ton. I'm sure the audience did too. And it's uh, really great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me and I enjoyed it. Awesome. Awesome listeners. Well, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Talented Learning Show. We hope you found value. We'll see you on the next. Have a great day. You can find more of our independent resources at talentedlearning.com. <laughs>